All right. So, um, so just making sure I got it. Sometimes it's a little confusing. Okay, here we are. So an introduction to mindfulness for stress reduction and well-being in these times. I'm going to start with the definition of mindfulness since that will help us just to uh, I'll be on the same page in case some of you are unfamiliar. So I define mindfulness as paying attention to present moment experiences with openness, curiosity, and a willingness to be with that experience. So how do we live more fully in this present moment, not lost in the past, not lost in the future, which is often where quite a bit of anxiety uh, lies. Mindfulness comes to us from um, the monasteries in Buddhist countries, but it's also been, um, it's, as it's as it's come to the to the U.S. over time, it's been adapted. We've done a lot of scientific research on it, and it's now become extremely popular. It was the cover of Time magazine a number of years ago, actually twice. I don't know if any of you happened to see this uh, episode of Mad Men. But mindfulness is spreading in a way that I never would have imagined. So I started meditating about 30 years ago, and at that time, it was a very unusual thing to do. Uh, at least here in the US. And then by now, 30 years later, I'm seeing it spreading into workplace, into education, into higher education, uh, law, first responders. And then there's so much going on in the healthcare field and also the mental health field. And there's a lot being done at UCLA too, which is really wonderful to see um, mindfulness being incorporated in all sorts of ways. For each of us, there's a lot of potential benefits, including, as I've been talking about, the reduction of stress and anxiety. There's research showing it helps with attention, cultivating more self-awareness and self-regulation, so regulation of our emotions. It can improve our relationships and is a helpful self-care tool. So I'm really hoping that all of you right now have something that is helping you, that is supportive. And so maybe mindfulness will be another tool to add to your toolbox, but I hope you have some other things as well. So let's talk a little bit about mindfulness and its scientific studies. There's been a number of research, it's still a fairly young field. There's probably only about five to 6,000 studies right now, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually a relatively small amount of studies. But we've looked at mindfulness and its relationship to, I, I mentioned a number of different issues like chronic pain, insomnia, um, anxiety, depression, attention. There's been quite good re research looking at chronic pain, anxiety, depression. The research is very robust. There is research, so in terms of physical conditions, there's research that shows that it helps with inflammation related conditions. It can even impact, positively impact genetic markers for inflammation um, when we practice mindfulness over a period of time. This um, studies show that when we're under stress, we have cortisol response, an inflammatory response that happens, an increase in cortisol, and our immune response is depressed. But when we practice meditation and mindfulness, and, um, as well as other types, and we can talk about other types of meditation in a little bit, um, there is a reduction of the inflammatory response, reduced cortisol, and the immune response is boosted. So this is good news. Right now, we need to do things that boost our immune system. This was a study done. It was one of the early studies, and it was done with people who have psoriasis, which is, I'm sure you know, is that itchy skin condition, and it's stress-related. They had people, they had one group go through the typical treatment, which as you see here is like a tanning, it's almost like a tanning bed, it's UVB rays on the skin, while the, um, the, another group practiced mindfulness meditation as they were doing the treatment. The group that practiced the mindfulness, their skin cleared up twice as fast, so it took like 30 days instead of 60 days. So there's been studies like this replicated, looking at boosting the immune system, uh, improving the healing response, reducing inflammation, and just working with stress-related conditions that um, mindfulness seems to be quite helpful. It's also helpful for mental health. As I mentioned, the, the research here is, is quite good. Um, there's a number of studies showing that mindfulness can help uh, reduce anxiety, and um, because it's so helpful, it's been incorporated into a variety of clinical treatments like mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which works with people with depression, and acceptance and commitment therapy, 
um, for anxiety and depression, dialectical behavioral therapy for borderline personality disorder. But you don't have to have a particular diagnosis. You can just have the ordinary anxiety and depression we're all facing right now because it's such challenging times, as I was mentioning. And mindfulness can be quite helpful for this. This was an interesting study that was done where they had about 2,500 people all around the world whom they buzzed in their smartphones in random intervals during the day. And as you can see here, they asked them three questions. Those three questions were, what are you doing? Is your mind on it? And how is your mood? So whatever they were doing, they could have been walking the dog or brushing their teeth or in class or at work or anything. And then they were just buzzed and they had to answer those three questions. What they learned, first of all, 49.6% of the time were not in the present moment. So about half the time you are doing something that your mind is not on. When your mind is not in the present moment, what are you doing? Well, typically you're thinking about one of three categories. Your mind is either thinking about something that is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And the research showed that you're doing that about equally, like one in each category, fairly, like, like a third of the time pleasant things, a third of the time unpleasant, third neutral. If you're thinking about, if you're not in the present moment and you're thinking about pleasant things, people report being happy. But the other two thirds of the time, we're not in the present moment thinking about unpleasant or neutral things, in which case people reported being unhappy. If, however, they reported that they could bring their mind to the present moment, then they reported happiness, even if they were doing things they didn't like. So, even, so if, let's say your mind is wandering, you're, you're washing the dishes and you're thinking about all the stress you have to do at work tomorrow, and maybe you don't particularly like to wash the dishes, but you're stressing about, out about tomorrow's work. If you bring yourself, you're unhappy, if you bring your attention to the present moment, feel the dishes, notice your feet on the floor, the smells, the touch, the heat, the warmth, people report more happiness. Um, so we have uh, done studies at UCLA looking at mindfulness and attention. The mindfulness is very helpful and you'll see this in a little while because when we do the practice, you'll see that in some ways it can be thought of as a training in attention. At UCLA, we brought 40 adults and adolescents through an eight-week mindfulness protocol, which is very similar now to what we teach at, at UCLA through our MAPS classes, our Mindful Awareness Practices classes. What we discovered was both in the adolescents and adult groups that there was an improvement in ADD symptoms and in what's called conflict attention. So conflict attention, there's different types of attention, but conflict attention is when you're trying to pay attention to one thing, but your mind is being distracted by many things. So if you have ADD, you sort of go over here, right? You go to the other thing. But with, with mindfulness training, people were able to stay focused on one thing. And this is very helpful, for instance, with kids trying to pay attention to the teacher when they're being distracted in the classroom. This was an early study done, uh, first of all, when I, when I first came on at UCLA in 2008, and um, there's been more research similarly since. This study was done with advanced meditators. So this is kind of one of the really interesting early studies where they looked at the brains of people who had been meditating for a really long time. And these are people like in caves in the Himalayas for 30 years, and they wanted to compare their brains to people of the same age range. And so what they discovered was that, so, so you may or may not know this, probably you know this, but as you age, your brain thins out. So if you want something else to worry about it, there you go, you can worry about that. It's called age-related cortical decline. However, in this study, in the advanced meditators, in two areas of the brain, the insula and the prefrontal cortex, they did not see the, um, the, the decline, the thinning of the brain. So you can tell that because the blue is the meditators and the, um, the red is the control group. And you can see that it stayed constant versus in the control group over time, this is age here, over time it got um, thinner, but not with the meditators. Um, this is a good sign because the prefrontal cortex, as I'm sure many of you know, is really, it's really important part of our brain. It's the part of our brain that's that we think of as our, the CEO of our brain. It's responsible for executive functioning, for delayed gratification, working memory, flexible thinking, 
Um, this is the emotional regulation. This is an important part of our brain that we wanted to see. Now, I put this study up because some of you are thinking, so what, this happened to people who meditated over 30 years. But there was a study that was done, there were actually several, looking at novice meditators and saw changes in just 27 minutes a day of practice um, in similar areas. So that actually is quite exciting and more to be done here. We can change our brains. They used to think that our brains stopped developing after about, I know the slide is very strange, but they used to think that our brains stopped developing after about age 25. Now scientists know that what we do with our brain is very significant. So if you think of yourself as a person who doesn't have good ability to pay attention, if you practice it, you will create new neural pathways and you can uh, develop your ability to pay attention. Last one I'll mention just quickly is this, because this was just published uh, a few months ago, was we um, studied people who were, who were given a mindfulness meditation while practicing a game that, that measured their ability to donate. And as you can see here, the mindfulness group donated at uh, two and a half times the control group, which is interesting for the impact of mindfulness on other things like pro-social behavior and altruism. And then I won't go into these, but these are a number of studies that we've done at UCLA. We've done some work with kids. We've done a study uh, looking at sleep improvement in older adults. We've been doing a number of studies looking at, uh, sorry, here with um, breast cancer survivors. And right now we're in a multi-site study with two other university hospitals. And um, we're currently doing ones for Alzheimer caregivers and completed one for pediatric residents. Okay, so just give you, I just want to give you a sense of why we might do these practices and some of the interesting science behind it. But let's talk about what mindfulness is. Paying attention to our present moment experiences with openness, curiosity, and a willingness to be with that experience. Keeps our mind from being lost in the past or the future. If you were to check into your mind at any point in the day, you would probably notice that you're lost in the past or thinking about something that's coming up, you're catastrophizing. Oh no, what if this happens? Going to the worst case scenario or you're replaying something and wishing you hadn't said it or wishing you hadn't done that. I don't know if this looks familiar to any of you. Most of us wake up in the middle of the night worried about things. One of the things I try to tell my students is don't believe anything you think in the middle of the night. It's always distorted in some way. So if you can just remind yourself, okay, this is nighttime thinking, because the next morning we sometimes look at our thoughts and say, mm, that was a little bit uh, distorted. So mindfulness, secondly, it counteracts automaticity. Automaticity is that quality of going through life kind of like a, 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 an autopilot. Right? I have here an image of a robot, like you're just going through the motions of your life. People who practice mindfulness report a sense of being more fully present in their life, inhabiting their life, more gratitude, more connection, more appreciation for life as it is. And this is really important. I think right now our life circumstances are having, helping many of us to feel more appreciation. And some of us are you know, dealing with very heavy stuff. So these moments of, of goodness or connection feel really quite special. Um, mindfulness helps us to have more of the sense of inhabiting our lives. Um, I once had a student uh, who was a physician who was started attending mindfulness classes and he said he had lived on his street for 20 years and it wasn't until he took the mindfulness class that he noticed that there were mountains at the end of the street. We can often be quite checked out of life on autopilot. Last thing is mindfulness is something we already know and experience. It's not some mystical tradition that is, you know, going to teach you something really special or different. We've all had aspects of mindfulness in our lives at some point or another, whether it's when you've been in nature and you felt fully connected and present or in the midst of sports activities where you're just, you know, you're in that flow in the zone or in creative activity, art or music or singing or dancing or something. So mindfulness is a part of what it means to be a human being. And I think about children a lot because children are um, really mindful. 
Have you noticed that? And those of you who are with little kids a lot, um, especially when they're super little, there's, there's this quality of being present with everything. And I know when my daughter was little and I would take her to walk down the street and she'd want to look at every little bug on the road and on the sidewalk. And I would be trying to get to point some other point. And it was like, I had to stop and be in the present moment with her. Well, all of us were like that. All of us had this capacity to be in the present moment, but things happened, you know, we got educated, we went through life, we had our challenges and mindfulness in some way is just about bringing us back to something we already know. This capacity that is an inherent capacity of every human being to come home to oneself, to be present, connected at home. So with all that being said, enough talking. Actually, I'm going to continue to talk, but I'd like us to do it in a meditative form. We're going to do a practice of mindfulness. I want to teach you the basics that I start off with people when they're just starting out. And I just encourage you to get comfortable. I know where you are right now, you might be on a chair or cushion, couch, bed, it doesn't matter, but see if you can be somewhat upright, not too rigid or tight. And you might have your feet on the floor or at least just, just so that you feel like your body is supported. Some of you might be cross-legged, that's fine. Whatever is going to support you. And we'll just be meditating maybe 12 minutes or so, 10, 12 minutes. So just a posture you can sustain. Your hands can be resting wherever they're comfortable. I'm actually gonna stop the share. Okay. Your hands can be resting wherever they're comfortable and your eyes can be closed. If that doesn't feel comfortable to you, you can keep them open, but just not looking all around. And let's begin by taking a few deep breaths. And as you take these deep breaths, allowing yourself to settle in more deeply to invite in the possibility of rest and relaxation. We can notice our feet wherever they are, maybe they're on the floor. And if your feet are on the floor, you can feel the connection of the ground beneath your feet. And as you feel that connection, noticing the weight and the heaviness and, and just imagine that even if you're many stories uh, above, that the earth is below you. You're supported by the earth. Feeling your feet on the ground or connected maybe in the furniture in some way, wherever they are. And just allowing yourself to feel that connection. And sometimes when my mind gets really anxious or caught up in things, if I can just stop and feel my feet on the ground and feel held by the ground, it can be very calming, soothing. So you can notice your legs and feel where your legs make contact with the chair, or couch, bed, wherever you are. There's heaviness and pressure, warmth. You can feel your back against the chair and what that feels like, hardness, soft pressure. Notice your stomach area. Is your stomach tense or tight? See if you can allow it to soften. You might take a deeper breath into your stomach area. We often hold a lot of tension in our stomachs, allowing that to release. Let's notice our hands. Can you feel the tingling, warmth? vibration of your hands. Let your hands be soft.
Notice your arms and shoulders, softening your shoulders, release. And noticing your throat, your face, facial muscles soft. Now notice your whole body present here, whatever is happening in this moment, we can be aware of this body. Now let's turn our attention to the sounds around us. There are sounds maybe in your room that you're in or outside your room. Some people think you have to be in a totally silent place to meditate, but actually you can practice in the midst of sounds. So just listen to the sounds as they come and go. As if you were listening to your favorite music. Often when we hear a sound, we start to think about the sound. What is it? Why are they doing that? Or we like it or dislike it. See if you can simply listen. Curiosity, openness. Now let's bring our attention back into our bodies, noticing that our body is breathing. So at this point, let your breath be natural. Let it do whatever it's doing. In and out through your nose. And see if you can find your breath in your body. Maybe you feel it in your abdomen, rising and falling, expanding and contracting. Or your chest rising and falling, expanding and contracting with each breath. Or you might notice the air moving through your nose, tingling, warmth, coolness. In mindfulness meditation, it's helpful to have something to focus on, to keep you kind of connected and something you can keep coming back to. So you can use your breath in your abdomen or chest or nose. Or if you like listening to sounds, you can use that. Pick whichever is the clearest or the easiest. And if you're not sure, can't decide, they all work equally well. So you can just choose something. And now we're going to practice noticing moment after moment, breath after breath, or sound after sound. One breath ends, the next breath begins. Now, as you do this, what probably starts to happen is your mind starts to wander, start thinking about all sorts of things, planning, remembering. When this happens, you're not doing anything wrong. It's completely normal. When you notice that you're lost in thought, you can say a soft word in your mind, like thinking or wandering, and then gently redirect your attention right back to your main focus, to the breath or the sound. And then you just keep doing that over and over, coming back again and again. Other things might happen 
maybe some body sensations or you might feel sleepy or restless or some emotion. If it's in the background, let it stay in the background and keep doing what you were doing with your breathing or the listening. If it becomes really obvious or strong, you can turn your attention to it, notice, feel, attend to it, and then come right back to what you were doing, feeling your breath or listening to sounds. So I'm gonna stop talking for about two minutes or so, and we'll practice this on our own. So now let's um, just notice as we bring the meditation to a close, how you're doing in your body and mind. 
How, how am I feeling having done this meditation? And if you're feeling more relaxed and at ease, you can enjoy that. If you're feeling something else, notice what's here, letting whatever is here be here. This is mindfulness. And when you're ready, for all of us, I'm going to ring a bell and you can end the meditation. So thank you for giving that a try. Maybe some of you have been meditating for some time and this is something you do regularly. What I'd love you to do now is to put in the chat your experience, what happened. So anyone who feels like it, you don't know how to do it, but whoever wants to, what, what happened when you did it or any questions that came up as you did the, this meditation. So we'll just take a pause right now for you to share your experience or questions that arose. While you're doing that, I'm going to guess one thing that I'm sure happened for some of you, which is you got sleepy. I'm curious, did anyone get sleepy or even fall asleep? Um, if that's the case, you are absolutely normal. This is what happens when we meditate, especially I'm guessing most of us don't get quite enough sleep. No one really does. And so we sit and we come into the setting and it's quiet and it's peaceful and our eyes are closed and oftentimes people get sleepy. So if you start to, if you start to be practicing and you're get, um, you find yourself getting sleepy, you can just open your eyes. If you're, you're at home, so you could stand up, just anything that can bring some energy into your meditation. I'm really curious. I'm not seeing anything yet, so I'm curious. Um, yes, that's a great question. I'm seeing if there are other shares about what happened when you did the meditation. I'd love to hear. So the word mindfulness and meditation. Meditation is a big category, like sports is a big category. And um, there's hundreds of types of sports and there's hundred, maybe not hundreds, but dozens and dozens of types of meditation. So some of you may have done other kinds of meditation in the past, like transcendental meditation or um, you might have done some kind of music meditation or movement meditation. Mindfulness is a type of practice. It's cultivated through meditation practice. So sometimes you'll hear me kind of using the words interchangeably, but know that mindfulness is sort of one of many types of meditation, and it's the one that our center has expertise in. I'm not seeing anybody sharing anything. So I'm going to guess that some of you found that your minds wandered. Am I right? Did your attention wander while you were doing, while you were meditating? If it did, it was because you are, um, you are nor also normal. <laughs> Our minds wander when we meditate, when we practice mindfulness. So the idea is not to have this perfect, like laser sharp, meditation on our breath or something like some people think that for instance all our thoughts gonna, are going to disappear and we'll be in this blank space that's not what happens what happens is for most of us is our attention wanders we think about other things and then we redirect it we just keep coming back and this is really helpful it trains your mind in coming back into the present moment and it happens over time it's almost like going to the gym right? It's like, it's like going to the gym and you just keep coming back. Um, so Nancy was saying, the problem is I feel meditation is wasting time. But the same thing with sleeping at night. You mean you feel like sleeping is wasting time? Um, I get severe anxiety. I sleep two or th three in the morning. Meditation makes me more anxious than relaxing or it makes me cry. Okay, so let me say a couple of things. Um, taking care of yourself is never wasting your time. There, 
most all of us were here in the medical center. We, we work in helping professions. We are taking care of other people all day long. We have got to be able to take care of ourselves. And so that is what equips us to help others. So if this voice inside you says, oh, I shouldn't do this, I'm wasting my time, just remind yourself that it's actually by taking care of yourself that you can better help others. Now, your second question is a little different because sometimes when you do, maybe you've done mindfulness before and you've noticed that strong emotions have come up and that you're feeling more anxious. So, so some people that happen, some people they do the practice and they just find themselves like really deeply relaxing, really connected. Other people, it brings up other emotions. Now, those are the things that are happening all along, but we're so busy in our lives that we don't give it time and space. So, um, oh, it looked like I wasn't able to see your chat. So that was the problem. Okay. Um, so, so just to say, if you continue on with mindfulness, there are other, there are tools, mindfulness-based tools to help you work with difficult emotions. And in the beginning, to just do little bits of it, like try it for one minute and see what that's like, or just try, I'm gonna give you some practices in a few minutes that you can do during the course of the day. And maybe the meditating is making you anxious, but these little moments of mindfulness might make a difference. Um, Demetra said that they're interrupted by a knock at my door. I enjoyed this few minutes I had. Maybe I shouldn't do this at work. Well, a lot of people do uh, do, do this at work. You can, because it, I mean, we can't control the people knocking on our door so unfortunately it got held short but it cut short but if you can even just like a minute or two in the midst of your day it is going to make a difference um fiona liked the word to help refocus her mind uh okay so lots of people walking around and talking so it makes me feel like i'm wasting time or not being productive it can feel that way. Maybe it feels like I'm not doing anything because my mind is just wandering the whole time or people are sort of bugging me or all I'm thinking about is getting annoyed at everybody outside. Why don't they understand that I'm meditating? Um, so it might be like it's better to do it at home when you can have a little bit more chance of quiet. Although I know some of you live in households right now that are you know, filled with little kids and of course, we're all at home, right? But, but so, well, so actually, I don't know. Some of you have gone into work and some of you are at home. So it's a different situation for each of us. See if you can find that time that you'll have the most space for yourself. But it's not, I don't know how to stress it enough. It's not being unproductive to take a little bit of time to regulate your emotions, to come into yourself, to find a peace of, peace of mind in the midst of our busy lives, especially right now especially right now where so much is demanded of ourselves. So Reza was asking, what does a daily meditation practice look like for an average, relatively busy person who is just starting out? Yeah, I will go into my recommendations and I'll do that in a moment about, about doing that. Um, and so um, someone was saying that sometimes when they meditate, they get a little nauseous. So there's there there as I was saying before there may be feelings inside that are just that have been there and then we sit down and we get a little quiet and things happen that like maybe we feel some discomfort some of us as I said might feel really peaceful some of us might feel discomfort um, Nancy was saying nausea so here's my suggestion just if you're attracted to doing it and you want to keep doing it, like I said earlier, do little bits at a time and see what happens. There's also walking meditation. There's also um, there's movement meditation. So there might be another way to practice that is going to be more supportive to you. Our UCLA um, classes, the MAPS classes, the Mindful Awareness Practices classes, it's a six-week class where it teaches you a variety of different meditations, including eating meditation even. So that's something that you can practice. And maybe one of those might work better for you. Um, let's see. Lisa sent me a question. I'm not sure I got it, Lisa. Oh, wait. oh, 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 I see. It was the person who I think I, uh, I think Nancy forwarded it. And I wonder what is more rejuvenating, a meditation session or a nap? <laughs> I'm not sure about the research there. I'm not sure if there has been research comparing mindfulness to a nap. I've seen 
um, I've seen once I heard I heard the study, but I, I can't like give you the study to refer to where they're saying like doing a short amount of meditation is equivalent, like a short amount, even like five minutes is equivalent to a nap. Um, I would have to look that up, but I do. Mindfulness is not only about quieting our minds and getting peaceful. It also gives us skills to work with reactivity, with emotional regulation, so that when you're, you know, working with a patient, I mean, I don't know where all of you are working, but let's say you're working with a patient, and they really upset you, instead of, you know, getting more and more frustrated, you know, to take a pause, just take a breath and not get so lost in your reactivity with them. So there are uh, there are, um, all I can say is there are more benefits than just relaxation and it, to give it a try if you're interested in it. So when Dana was asking, are there particular meditations designed for patients in chemo? We are actually doing a study right now where I've created a six week class for patients in the hospital and um, we're, it's gonna be piloted with a stem cell research project at the University of Wisconsin, I think. And um, so if you're interested, you can kind of email me and I can give more information about that. It's not specifically chemo, it's just people who are in the hospital over a long period of time. And, um, and it's gonna be a pretty interesting study. Okay, these are great questions. I hope I got everybody. I want to make sure. Oh, oh, we're running out of time. So let me give you let me give you my little, couple of more points um, that I wanted to share. Okay, so hold on. Just come back to the the screen. So we did that. Um, so someone was asking, how can you do it? I recommend just five minutes a day. I'm going to give you a resource at the end of this, which is our UCLA Mindful app. We have five minute meditations, 10 minute meditations, 20 minute, 30 minute meditations, but everybody has time for five minutes. Our lives are very busy. And actually now you have more time for those of you who are not commuting, you have more time. You can squeeze in those five minutes. And then if you do five minutes and you feel like, oh, I'm, I'm wanting more to do, to do a little bit more. I mentioned that there are lots of types of meditations, like there are types of lots of sports. So mindfulness is a meditation practice as we learned. It's also a quality of attention that we can have at any moment. So this is really important for those of us who feel like I'm too busy to meditate or some of us were saying that when they do it, they feel, you know, that it feels a little anxiety producing. We can bring this quality of attention into our day. And what I want to offer you is a short acronym to help us remember to be mindful. So being mindful is not that hard. It's remembering to be mindful that can be challenging. So this acronym is STOP. We stop wherever, whatever we're doing. It doesn't mean freeze, but we just kind of stop, take a breath, observe what's happening inside me. Okay, my heart is racing. My stomach is a clenched. I'm annoyed. I'm feeling heat in my face. We just notice something that's happening. And as we do that and we take a few breaths, it often allows ourselves to calm down. And this, and then when we proceed, we proceed with more awareness and less reactivity. Reactivity, I said it earlier, but it's really acting out of our habitual patterns without consciousness. So even, so I use stop all the time and I'll give you just a simple example. Last, yesterday, my daughter knocked over a glass of water and it, the glass just shattered on the ground. My daughter's 11. And I could just feel, even though obviously it was an accident, not a big deal, but I could just feel this sense inside me of like, oh, you broke the glass. I love that glass. Why, you know, all of that coming to the surface. And at that moment, I just remember to stop and I stop and I took a breath. And as I observed, I noticed that I was very tense and I kind of relaxed my body. And as I started to calm down, I calmed my nervous system a little bit. And then my voice inside my head was like, it's not a big deal. It's just a glass. At which point I was able to be much more present and kind her, kinder to her. And I just said, hey, come on, let's clean it up. It's not a big deal. So that's just a way, you know, we're, we're because many of us are living in close close quarters. I know some of us are not. Those of us who are not wish they were, and those of us who are wish they were living alone. That's what's happening these days. But we can use it in relationships. We can use it when we get an email. That's frustrating. We can use it when we get frustrated with a coworker or a patient. Or Mindfulness is available for you. It's a quality of attention you can have at any moment. So 
I just want to um, want to um, offer that. So actually, I'm going to screen share one more time because I want to give you some resources. Here we go. Okay, so I'm going to give you some resources. Oh, now it went to the beginning. Ah, okay. Let me last. Oh no. Okay, hold on, everybody. Just give me, bear with me for two secs while I get this going. Now you can see my whole PowerPoint once again. You can memorize it. Okay, so here we are. And all right, here's the resources I want to share with you. So the UCLA Research Center, Mindful Awareness Research Center, we teach mindfulness to the Los Angeles community, UCLA campus, School of Medicine, and worldwide. And we're part of the Integrative Medicine Center. We're so excited about that and just can't wait to see how that continues to evolve in the Integrative Medicine Collaborative. Um, everything we do now is virtual. So we've turned our whole center. It used to be lots of live things online and it's all available to anyone. Many, much of it is free. Our mission is to foster mindful awareness across the life scan, span through education research to promote well-being and a more compassionate society. We want to have mindfulness radically accessible to all. So we do education, research, public programs, free drop-in meditations that says citywide, but now it's worldwide, trained teachers, and um, our, we have a ma our MAPS classes, which I mentioned. So just so you know, some resources for you so far every Monday and Thursday at 1230, if you go to the MARC website, and I will give you that resource, you can meditate. Oops meditate with me. Um, we do MAPS classes where you learn basics of mindfulness. There's online mindfulness day longs and retreats of several days. This Saturday at from 10 to 4 I will be teaching a mindfulness a, a day long which you're welcome to join and be fine for a beginner called cultivating self-compassion and that's like that's it's something you'll be doing in your home and I'll be guiding you through Zoom. And uh, there are lots of resources on our website. We also have an app that the UCLA um, IT department created for us, and it has all sorts of meditations for you to give a try, and it's totally free and will be free forever, I assume. Um, Elizabeth mentioned my books, Fully Present and The Little Book of Being, which are available everywhere that books are sold. And so lastly, there is the website for our center. And we're also, we definitely come to different um, departments and share about mindfulness and offer workshops and programs to that suit your um, community. So you're welcome to contact me about that. So I think I'm gonna stop the share. And um, it looks like we have a couple of minutes. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'll take any last questions to wrap up and then maybe we'll end with one minute of meditation. Lisa was saying, I'd like, I plan to take a live maps class. If I miss it, will it be available as a recorded lesson? Yeah, yeah, you'll have access to our recorded sessions. Huh? If there's any final questions, I'll take them now. I see earlier someone said one of my patients said she would rather meditate than sleep. Person after my own heart. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> mm. uh, research comparing benefits of meditation to prayer. I am not exactly sure about that. I know there is some cross, cross modality research and I'd have to look it up. I'm not sure exactly. So what I'm thinking maybe is we'll just end with a tiny little bit of meditation um, just to close. And um, you can always contact me through the Mark Center or through the Integrative Medicine Collaborative. And um, let's just take a moment to sort of pause together and take a breath or two. You can close your eyes if you wish.
And I just want to um, just take a moment to reflect on ways that you have been touched by other people's goodness during this time. Maybe you've had seen colleagues work extra time or go above and beyond the call or offer acts of kindness to others. And we can think about it in this health system. We can think about it, maybe something in your life, just where you've been touched by people's goodness. And you might just offer in your minds a silent appreciation to all of these people. And we can think about all of the people throughout the health system who are doing so many incredible things in this time of crisis to serve and heal and care for so many people. Just wish everyone well and bring, and also know that you are included in that. You can just, if it feels right, just appreciate yourself in some way for what you've done, your role in this. And we can notice ourselves present here. Take one more breath with awareness. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes or end the meditation. Thank you so much, everyone. Hope to see you in other forms. Take care. Thank you, Diana, for touching us with your goodness. And on behalf of the collective audience, we extend our heartfelt gratitude to you. Thank you. Thank you. So the session has been recorded. It'll be posted to our website. And we'll see you all again next month, the second Wednesday of every month at 12 o'clock.